first of all, let me thank you, Margot, for agreeing to do this HPT video with me today over Zoom. This is our second video since the first one we did way back in 2009. That seems like a long time ago now, Guy, considering everything that's happened in the last 10 years. Yes, that's so true. For our audience, would you please introduce yourself? And let's start off by you telling us where you grew up. Okay, I was actually born in Ozark County, Missouri. And except for the two years that we spent in Wichita, Kansas during World War II, while my brother was in Europe and my parents, uh, to do their part, decided to go to Wichita, Kansas, where they both worked for Beach Aircraft. My mother was one of the original Rosie the Riveters. And of course, the uh, five of us kids who were still at home went to school there. And then after VE Day and VJ Day, my dad took us back to the farm. But somehow, innately, he knew that my brother would have difficulty re-entering that kind of life after years in Europe. And he bought an auto repair garage and service station and grocery store to put them in business together. And so we got back into schools. I rode a school bus from dark in the morning to dark at night, um, about two hours to graduate eventually from high school in Southern Missouri. And four days later, left for California as a young bride. People often ask me, in California at least, what brought you to California? And my answer has been a tall, blonde California guy in a powder blue Plymouth convertible. <laughs> but after a year uh, in an abusive marriage, I realized that I could not continue that. And I had a, a baby, and so I went to work at McClellan Air Force Base. I had only seen role models of teachers and farmers, and so I didn't know what kind of career to ask for. Fortunately, I didn't tell them I could type. And so I got a job in what would today be called IT as a clerk. Uh, we call it data processing in those days. And then that fall, I enrolled in a technical college that did courses on the base. And that began my 22 years of combined work and study that eventually led to three degrees. What, uh, what, what did you study and what are your degrees in? Well, my, uh, of course, uh, lower division work was in general business, uh, probably called liberal arts today. And then my upper division work was in management and business. And I did graduate with all college honors from Sacramento State University, uh, California State University, Sacramento. And then Later, after launching my business and uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area, I enrolled in John F. Kennedy University and uh, did my MBA there with a emphasis on advanced management theories. Can you share with us a little bit about uh, where you now live and uh, what you do professionally work-wise? Well, I guess uh, I'm now in mid-Missouri after almost 70 years in California. Um, I came here about three years ago because my sister was ill and needed help uh, financially, legally, and uh, with her health management. And my son had started a vineyard on some property we bought here. So after eight and a half years with the Air Force and 11 years with Pacific Telephone Company, um, and then starting MMHA, the Manager's Mentors, 46 years with it. Uh, I guess I'm now a, a viticulturist and uh, growing wine grapes and farming again. <laughs> Very interesting. Well, 
uh, let's uh, let's kind of go back into that career and that career progression. And and can you share with us some of the you know, more interesting HPT-ish kinds of things that you've done over your career? Well, Guy, I consider all of my work to have been interesting, some of it more challenging than others. And looking back on the various experiences, I now know how some of my career decisions were made because with the Air Force, for example, eight years, uh, about midway, I learned of an accelerated promotion program that was available to male college graduates who were not yet employed. And I acted out one of Margot's maxims, and that is push back. So I went to the post office and took the exam and brought my results back, and I did get into the program. So that got me into further education as well as becoming a budget analyst and budget officer and then when i had uh, finished my undergraduate work uh, at cal state i was recruited and hired by the telephone company uh, again in an accelerated promotion program that was called map it was management achievement program but of course, literally was a men's achievement program because I was the first woman who was ever admitted to the program. And after three weeks of reading SOPs, Standard Operating Procedures, you know that from your military career, um, I was bored and said, I want a real job. And I got my first line job with uh, Pacific Telephone. And uh, after 11 years, I had had 10 different line management, large, sometimes 300 or more people uh, in operations in the accounting department. And so those were challenges that I enjoyed because I could find problems, I could get them solved, I could improve results. So I guess that kind of started me on a results orientation to human performance systems. And at during that time, I also went through an accelerated, uh, excuse me, a personal growth seminar. And for the first time in my life, uh, if you can call this a turning point or a tipping point, I realized how our needs and interests and values must be aligned if we're going to achieve goals. And looking back, I realized that my values had been conflicted with both working for the Department of Defense, working hard for something I hoped would never happen, war, and then even with the telephone company where I couldn't make cost-effective decisions about capital expense versus you know, other types of expenditures. So I had a friend who was uh, an officer in what was then called Toastmistress, and it's now inter was International Training and Communications, and Evelyn was a vice president at Transamerica, first one, female. And she said, Margo, I think when we find ourselves in a situation where our values are conflicted, we have to be willing to say, go to hell. And you have a go to hell plan. Hers included getting two sons through college. So I started mine on a little card and put it in my wallet. And mine included getting my credentials in order so that I could work professionally in performance improvement or HPT, getting my finances in order, of course, and then being able to launch my own business. And that took four years. Uh, during that time was when I discovered that uh, I needed to add to my uh, resume or whatever. And I had been transferred to San Francisco and asked to set up the first performance improvement group at headquarters in uh, Pacific Telephone. And that's when I found NSPI and ASTD. Excellent. Thank you. So uh, tell us, let's dive a little bit more into this first exposure to uh, the you know, programmed instruction and training kind of thing, and then beyond that into other aspects of performance improvement because you would have been exposed to the training kinds of thing at ASTD and programmed instruction at NSBI, I'm sure. 
and then the ISBI began to kind of yeah. move away from strictly instruction to looking at the other variables. But can you talk a little bit about uh, what that was all about back then? Yes, because as I said, this was a new position. Um, headquarters AT&T had just discovered programmed instruction and Dr. Richard Peterson had um, been at a meeting in Chicago and my boss asked me to go there and meet him. And he was the one who put the blessing on me to establish this new group in Pacific Telephone. And we launched three projects. Uh, I eventually hired a staff of about eight people. And then I hired people like Bill Bitterline and Gary Rumler and his crew from Michigan to come and help me train my staff and work on these projects. One was in what was called telephone operations. One was in uh, the plant department line and number assignment. And the third one was in the commercial department where they do billing and that kind of thing that I was supervising these projects. And in 1966, then, I went to my first NSPI conference and that uh, because I learned that these people were involved in this professional organization where they helped each other to learn, which is, you know, one of my mottos. And at the very first conference, uh, I was walking down the hall a little nervous about being among all these luminaries and the board was having its board meeting but they were on break and they were all standing out in the hallway and this guy i later learned was bob mager reached out and said you ought to meet some of these people which i guess started my networking which i help other people to do very well and bob pulled me into the meeting and introduced me to susan markle and glenn valentine and bob phillip and you know uh, people who eventually were uh, leaders and officers in the organization. Um, during that meeting, I probably also met Roger Kaufman, Gary Rumler. Uh, I know I met Don Toasty and Roger Addison, Joe Harless, uh, all people who were generous with their ideas and their experience and contributed to my growth. And I think that um, it's also notable, not a lot of people do know this, that a number of the NSPI, ISPI leaders and officers did come from the Bell system like I did because Harry Shoemaker was president, uh, so was Glenn Valentine, Fred Wells, Bob Powers, Mark Rosenberg, Char Cipher Wells, Pat Kaloran, Bob Carr, and of course me. And so I think that we brought a leadership experience and skills to the organization as it was in a good growth period. Yes, I've heard, uh, I think it was a Rumler who made a comment once about if it hadn't been for the military and AT&T, NSPI would have not uh, flourished because a lot of the consulting engagements that they were all fighting for came from one of those two sources, uh, yes. Um, uh, so, so can, can you continue a little bit? So that was your entree to NSPI and uh, a lot of these kind of folks and, and you were starting your own PI organization. I'm assuming that was programmed instruction. And can you tell us a little bit more about your career from that point on? Well, as I said, uh, you know, I really began with the telephone company and 65, uh, 66 timeframe and ISPI in 66 uh, specifically as an organization. And then having gone through this growth seminar and deciding that I couldn't work where my values were conflicted, I did found MMHA in 1974 and, uh, you know, subcontracted with Battelle Laboratories. That's where I actually started working with Roger Kaufman on projects that we worked on together. So it wasn't just programmed instruction, it was performance improvement even then at the mega level and having an impact on society. And I think that, you know, launching my business, I decided that we would really focus on an unfilled niche 
uh, which was facilitated mentoring and building on my experience with the two accelerated promotion programs that became one of our lines of business. A second one was because I had a unique skill set of line management, I could have a strategic planning model that would stand the test of time. And we call that a balance of concerns for quality, productivity, and people. And then the performance improvement model that most everybody uses some parts of it, uh, ADI is what a lot of people call it. I don't think I ever used the term HPT uh, as what we were doing because it really focused on the whole performance environment uh, as Roger Addison says, you know, the work, the worker, the workplace. And of course, I was working at the world level. Uh, probably the most rewarding work I've done, well, there are a couple of areas. One was the uh, leadership development in reproductive health that focused on the UN Millennium Development Goals of reducing maternal mortality and infant mortality and the spread of HIV AIDS. So for eight years, uh, I worked on a leadership development program that took me to Pakistan, Ethiopia, the Philippines, India, uh, you know, boots on the ground, helping people to make a difference in the health of their lives. And then uh, my esteemed colleague, Luis Gasparotto, took the model uh, into Latin America and continued to expand that work in five Latin American countries. So seeing the evidence of results from that certainly reinforced my uh, desire to work where you could show measured results. And, you know, that came out of my Bell system training is that everything was measured to the nth degree and you had a results book that you looked at every month and your organization budget lived or died based on those results. So uh, that's been my focus and knowing that for example, with uh, the telephone company, you couldn't get a installer to install a, a telephone correctly, connecting colored wires if he, at that time, was colorblind. So it wasn't a matter of training, it was a matter of changing the workplace because uh, the, the wires had to be coded another way in order to get them done correctly. So that has continued to be my focus is take the big picture look and look at the workplace, look at the work that's being done. Can it be supported in ways other than, you know, sending people back to school? We discussed this a, a little bit, but uh, I, I wanted to find out from you who you, your biggest influences were in this whole evidence-based practices for performance improvement. Uh, you know, I think uh, somebody told me that it was Harold Stolovich that uh, named it HPT, and that's always been controversial, uh, the name for this uh, approach to performance improvement. But so can you, can you share with us in a way to share with others so that they might investigate some of these people that you might mention, whatever their writings were and such, but who, who are some of your biggest influences? Because you've worked with quite a number of the luminaries of, of the whole effort. And you're, you are one yourself, but, you know, so who influenced you? Well, two things just popped in my mind. One is I have been privileged to work directly, I mean, directly on projects with so many of the people whose names I've mentioned, and I've learned from all of them. So it's hard to single out, you know, what I learned from Roger Kaufman, from what I learned from Joe Harless, from what I learned uh, actually uh, from B.F. Skinner, whose work I had followed. And when I invited him as the keynote speaker to our uh, NSPI 25th anniversary conference, he wrote me the nicest letter regretting that his health wouldn't permit him. And he addressed me as Dr. Murray. So now when I'm asked, well, do you have a doctorate? I can say, yes, it was awarded by B.F. Skinner in a letter. Well, that's just an aside. But uh, 
the other thing that popped in my mind, Guy, is that a lot of these people are leaving us. And what you're doing in making these videos and making them available is uh, uh, capturing that wisdom and that experience in a way that nobody else is. And so you are both a luminary yourself and a treasure in making this effort because, you know, no one of us can reach everybody. And yet each of us, and this is what I tell people as we work with uh, using mentoring as a strategy for leverage, if each of us could directly impact at least three people, and this was the strategy we used with reproductive health, that each of those people we worked with had to commit to passing on their technical and professional, uh, you know, the health skills as well as the uh, leadership skills to at least three people so that over a period of five years, instead of our being able to impact maybe the skills of 20 or 30 people, that could leverage to 700 and some people. And when you're working with millions of people who have harmful sexual practices that lead to disease and you know harm, uh, it's important to have that leverage. And so that's where I think the networking and using our contacts and making a commitment that when we learn something from somebody else, we have an obligation to pass it on. And that's what my t-shirt says, be a mentor, pass it on. <laughs> Oh, I agree so much with what you're saying. I, I you know, m my intent with the video series and my involvement with uh, NSPI and ISPI has always been to try to replicate as closely as I can my initial experiences and exposures and learnings, because I wish that those who desire to be in this business uh, could have that same kind of experience or close to it. But um, but let's go back to, so if you were to name some names, I know it's hard to single them out. So let's go with, you know, whatever handful of names that you might come up with. Um, uh, so, so, you know, you had a lot of impact from a lot of people, but what, what stands out and can you share with us what they taught you? If Roger Kaufman ta taught you about mega and doing societal good, and you learn maybe some, some techniques or practices from him, uh, talk to us a little bit about that and, and some of the other people as well. Okay, uh, you know, having recently been a part of the tribute to Bob Mager, that's fresh in my mind and that Bob really uh, taught me and a lot of us to get it down and then work at getting it good. And so when we felt blocked about research or writing or whatever, to at least get something down, documented, and then we could work at refining it, editing it, and proving it. So that's always been a practice of mine. And sometimes even answering an email, I force myself to leave it overnight. You know, I write something, I leave it overnight, I look at it. Uh, you know, when I was able to make direct contact with people, I always insisted on another set of eyes looking at anything we wrote or developed. So I would say that's another thing I learned from him. And of course, from Joe Harless, uh, you know, the front end part is what will result, what will enable you to get to the result that you want. So that's uh, obviously an important learning from him. But not all of my learning about results, of course, and that evidence-based focus came from people within ISPI. I mentioned Dick Peterson earlier. You know, he had a brain-damaged daughter from birth, and I learned about programming and patterning from him, from what he was working with his daughter to stimulate the reproduction of brain cells that had been damaged. And so my interest in brain mind research and eventually I invited Ned Herman when he was doing the right brain left brain work which has now been disproven of course uh, as a speaker in San Francisco at a conference and my first 
real mentor was Charlie Bell when I was working for the Air Force. And I've been uh, promoted and moved over to this budget position in the maintenance department. And I was responsible for ground communications, electronics and repair and aircraft modification. And Charlie, you know, removed obstacles for me in a way that I could use the skills I had and the intelligence I had to make a difference in the budgets of those important programs. And then later on, after I launched my own business, I had the distinct honor and pleasure of working with Howard McFan, Dr. McFan. And he's one of the civilian uh, award, national award recipients, the late Dr. McFan now, but Howard taught me so much about measurement and chaos theory and those things. So being able, I guess, to um, feed my insatiable curiosity, uh, I've been privileged to sit at the feet of true masters who were generous with me and sharing those learnings. And that's why when Roger Addison and Lynn Carney and Carol Haig and I were privileged to do the orientations to the conference, I chose to work on the networking piece because going back to my own first ISPI conference and the impact that that had had by being able to meet those people and to build my network of resources, I wanted to pass it on to newcomers, emerging professionals to the society to give them some strategies for being systematic about the way they contacted people and not just say, you know, tell me everything you know, but to have a specific question that they wanted to get from those people. And uh, another of Margot's maxims was walk to meet your luck. You know, some of us are lucky in the way we meet people. And I often tell a story when I'm facilitating work with uh, others that uh, one of our professional golfers was told once when he had won a major tournament, wow, you're really a lucky golfer. And he said, well, yes. And the more I practice, the luckier I get. And so I have reframed that as walk to meet your luck, whether it's practicing something or jotting down some questions that you want to gain from somebody else is being prepared to be helped. Very good, thank you so much for that. Let me shift gears a little bit here. Um, as a way of providing an example to others, um, and, and very few people that I've asked this question can actually do it in the time a lot, but if you were to give us a 30 second uh, elevator speech on what your career has been about, what you do, what you did, what would that be? Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> Professionally, I think I would say I live the epitaph that I wrote for myself in 1974. And that is that I help organizations and individuals create environments within which they achieve their own goals. And that since there's been very little client work this year and I've done lots of volunteer work, uh, personally struggling uh, with this change in my life, both geographically and of course work-wise, uh, I think that it's important that we be prepared um, I mentioned this recently in a message to some of the ISPI leadership is that we have to be prepared to take a large step when it's called for, because you can't cross a chasm in two small leaps. So true. Uh, well, talk to us a little bit about some of the volunteer work that you're doing um, and, and who you're doing it with and what, what you're doing with them. Well, I keep trying to volunteer with ISPI. I'm on the advisory group for the uh, BABS virtual hybrid chapter, and 
I think I'm adding value there. Uh, I've helped a young woman who has launched an online, she calls it the mentoring center, and she's matching uh, millennials with um, seasoned, experienced people worldwide. Uh, so that's been volunteering. Uh, with EMEA, I've obviously uh, contributed the European, Middle East, and Africa group, the International Mentoring Association still, and with uh, an organization that I obviously gain more than I give, and that's the Emotional Intelligence Training and Research Institute. Uh, the late Dr. Darwin Nelson and Dr. Gary Lowe, I've worked with since the early 80s, and when uh, people ask me, uh, well, what do you do for yourself? Because you are so generous with your volunteer time with other people. I say, I avail myself of people who are growthful for me and where I get replenished. And right now through that organization, I've been able to meet doctors uh, Fritz Liebowitz and uh, Sarah Spradlin who are doing some really important research in emotional intelligence and artificial intelligence. And one of the videos that they use in helping people to really examine this is with the uh, self-driving cars, where an engineer is sitting there totally confident, but the novice driver is an emotional wreck when you know the car is taking over. And I think with the advances in technology, and artificial intelligence that we haven't given enough attention to the emotional intelligence of the worker who will have to work in that workplace, that environment, or with that different work itself. So that's my current learning interest is more about where those AI and EI intersect and how can we really support people learning the skills of emotional intelligence, uh, empathy, their interpersonal comfort, uh, decision making, and, and you know, personal wellness and stress management under those kinds of conditions where you don't know enough about the technology to avoid the necessary, the, you know, inevitable stress that comes with it. Yes. Can you, are you doing any writing currently? Articles or? <laughs> uh, I'm actually not uh, doing any writing right now. I, I look back at things that I have in the books and workbooks and fortunately for me, I did things that were timeless. Uh, also, in uh, the major changes in my geographical location and, you know, physical environment and all of that in the last five years, um, I have not had the time that it takes to really carve out writing time because you can't do it in small increments or bytes. I put this in our using time workbook. Uh, you need dedicated days and weeks to write well and to get it down and then work at getting it good. Mm -hmm. And um, there, I know Roger Addison mentioned something recently. You might want to learn more about this. And I said, Roger, I think my disc is full. <laughs> I'm not sure that I really want to learn anything else at this point. And, and I certainly often say that at this time of my life, I use my brain for processing, not for storage. So I take advantage of any kind of reminders that I can get in my environment. Well, let's, and of course, I am learning about. Go ahead. Yes, go ahead. No, I was going to ask about uh, can you uh, talk to our audience a little bit about your book on mentoring and share with them a little bit about that so that they might. Uh, uh, follow up and, and take a look at that. Okay, thank you for that guy. Uh, I did the first edition, of course, in the 90s and thought that I had it all done because like I said, I've worked at timeless and useful things. And then I realized that the way, the strategy of using mentoring uh, 
to improve performance in the workplace and in people's lives had really shifted from just preparing people for promotion or upward mobility. It was now being applied by my clients to value diversity and to work in all kinds of environments like the reproductive health leadership where we used as, as a strategy for leverage of scarce resources. And so when I look back, I did do a second edition with examples and cases from a lot of different environments and was fortunate to interview a lot of people in uh, a lot of different environments where the drivers for the program uh, or process, as I prefer to call it, was very different. And now it, it still disturbs me that people use mentor as a verb, <laughs> but I've stopped tilting at that windmill because mentor was a person. And so it should be a noun, but people continue to use it as a verb. And of course, uh, I was on a webinar the other day where someone talked about reverse mentoring. And I thought at one time I would write an article called up, down, or sideways, it doesn't make any difference. If you have two people who have different skills and experiences and you want them to transfer them, that's a mentoring relationship. And the level of the person in the organization or their age or their you know, seniority or whatever shouldn't matter. Uh, a mentoring relationship is, by my definition, and this is in the book, Beyond the Myths, uh, a deliberate pairing of two people with different skills and experiences with the objective being that they transfer those both ways. And so both people get as well as give in that kind of relationship. And the book is very much a how-to book. It has a number of chapters that will help a mentor prepare for an effective and a fulfilling relationship. It has a number of chapters that are focused on how the protege prepares and doesn't just ask for everything to be one way. And it has chapters on how an organization can put this strategy in place to leverage their scarce resources and to provide the engagement, that's a very popular word now with organizations, and the affiliation needs that uh, people look for when they join an organization. And I think with the remote work that we're experiencing today and the distance of people, that it becomes even more important for people to find a re relationship with a mentor and because technology has helped us in this regard, the geographical distance doesn't matter anymore because just like we're doing with Zoom today and people can do with Skype or go to webinar or whatever, uh, people can have a meaningful, visually supported conversation today uh, with very little cost. And uh, that's one of the reasons I've wanted to help Lisel Mendoza with the mentoring club is to provide them with the foundation and the groundwork that lets these matched pairs uh, build a good relationship and realize the benefits that both of them can get from that. And it's in the book. <laughs> yes. And you, you made reference a few minutes ago to you don't like it being called a program. You prefer it being a process. Did I get that right? Yes, yes. Um, in fact, I lost that battle with the first edition of the book, but I want it with the second edition. I think if it's considered a process, it doesn't imply that there's a beginning and an end to it, where a program would cause people to think we have this program called mentoring and it's going to go away someday. But if it becomes one of the processes, that the organization uses uh, to engage people, to keep them motivated, to keep them feeling valued and respected. And for example, a mentor who has uh, years of experience with an organization may start to feel a little jaded 
and unappreciated. And if they can feel like, oh, we have this process that I can get involved with where I can pass on my experience and skills, I feel more valued and like I'm contributing to the results of the organization. And similarly, uh, when people having worked remotely, like most of us have, uh, me for a long time, but even a lot of organizational employees for the last five, six months start to feel their affiliation needs aren't being met. And if they have a mentor, then they can feel better about it. Um, it interestingly enough, I heard one uh, example recently that a uh, supervisor had started making a direct telephone contact with each of his, his in this case, direct reports once a week, which had never happened when they were in the same office together. And it's actually improved people's feeling about their manager, their supervisor, and the results are improving because they know that they're going to have a contact with their boss once a week. And previously it might've been once a quarter that hated performance appraisal or review that nobody prepares for well and nobody likes, and yet it seemed to be obligatory in some organizations. So, uh, you know, those are areas that may be a part of the silver lining that we all desperately need at this point. Yes. Well, my next question, but I think you've already answered that, was going to be about a term or a phrase that you would define for us. And you've already talked about mentor and mentoring. So is there another phrase that's used within the profession that you might want to tackle and and put your spin on it because perhaps you feel it's not being used appropriately or it's being misconstrued. What might you have? This is I'm. I'm... Uh, I couldn't think of a single phrase that was unique to me, which of course I would be searching for, other than the way I define mentoring. You know, I know that we identify a lot of other people in our field with a special phrase, Roger Kaufman with mega planning or the societal impact and people like Gary Rumler with the process improvement and that kind of thing. I don't think I have one other than uh, the mentoring process and for you know, people coming into the field, uh, I think that what I would want them to do is find their own, you know, there used to be a cement truck that I would see in California that says, find a need and fill it. <laughs> so I've always felt like I'm asked to do an informational interview. Unfortunately, it doesn't include what it used to, people would call me and say, could I take you to lunch and pick your brain? <laughs> so they don't do that now. It's like you know, have a virtual coffee and I can interview you about how you launched your career and that kind of thing. But for me, and what I would pass on is uh, for a new person entering our field, and I did have this kind of conversation a week and a half ago, someone who was just graduating college and wanted to uh, launch a consulting firm. And my counsel was get a job in a big organization first and get, develop some management skills, some leadership skills, preferably line management skills, so that you understand the world of business. Because I don't think a college degree prepares you to talk business uh, and get clients today unless there is some real unique service that you want to offer. And so that would be, you know, what I would encourage people to do coming into our profession today is think of the big picture, uh, use the words and definitions that are identified with the leaders in our field. And in my own experience, really 
focus on uh, not just the worker and training, not just the work and, you know, redesigning uh, task layout or, you know, job details, not just the workplace and changing the lighting like Hawthorne tried, but what is the real impact at the societal level in the world? And can I make a difference? And that may start with the impact I will have on one person. Maybe one person who takes the time to watch and listen to our conversation here will take one of Margot's maxims of walk to meet your luck, push back when that's appropriate, and live within your values and make their life better and then pass that on to two or three other people so that you leverage it to have a greater impact. That's exactly what I hope that uh, we can do with this particular video here is share your wisdom and insights with others. Margo, thank you so much for doing this video interview with me today over Zoom. Um, I, I hope to see you soon. I don't know when that'll be, but I hope to see you soon. <laughs> well, if nothing else, we can have a Zoom happy hour someday, Guy. <laughs> All right, thank you. And you stay safe and stay well. Thank You're you. welcome. All right, bye-bye.